Hey. Hello. Hey, hey. Hmm. What's up? Nothing. Um, oh, you know, um, I'm just rereading that that uh, Parliament again because I shit you not, I read it. I read up to like page 32, and I went back, and I can't. I didn't. I don't remember any of it. <laughs> <laughs> Did you so down funny. did you download from your email uh my marked up copy? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it I yeah, I saw that. <laughs> the yeah, I saw that. I uh oh my god. I, I I like I read this and I don't I don't I didn't read it. I didn't mm-hmm. I didn't <laughs> Why are you laughing? It's not funny. That's how I've been my whole life. Comprehension was my worst. Um, well, I mean, I'm not laughing at you. I'm just, I'm just laughing because it's funny. I mean, I, I, I've been there before too, you know. It's really hard for in the word. I'm trying to uh, all the words. Uh, I don't know. You know, like I said, it was a lot easier for me to understand the shit when I just knew nothing. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm trying to teach you. Nothing. I know, right? Shut up. (laughs) (laughs) Well, if you want to go through it together, we can look at it together. Okay. Um, um, Yeah. I mean, yeah. (laughs) I understand you were talking about meetings and how they conduct their meetings and yada yada. And... Anyway, I, I can't wait until it's like two weeks from now when I fucking start settling. Mm-hmm. And it's calm. And there's no disruptions and I don't have to worry about it. Anyway. Um, mm-hmm. What's that? I only got that to page 17, chapter 2. Um, rereading it, I was like, shit, I might as well just call him because it's getting later and later. <laughs> Did you get all the way through it at all? Not all the way to the end. I got to page 32 and I went, fuck. What does like, that mean? Where is that? Uh, um, almost, uh, almost to page 40. Well, it's eight pages short of 40. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm just saying that number is nebulous. It doesn't mean anything. Oh, hold on one second. What is um, the topic of discussion at that point? <clears throat> oh. <laughs> uh, oh, fuck. Sorry, Lucky. Shit. Okay, go get on your bed. I'm sorry, buddy. Holy shit. I just almost knocked him out with the door. Sure. <laughs> Probably don't recommend that. Here you go, Lucky. Sorry, buddy. Oh, I took a sip out. It was um Oh, this is no fucking convenient. Rights of members or something like that. I don't remember. Well, I would have. Yeah, right to protection. Uh. Um, I mean, I would have preferred you read the whole thing before we discussed it, but we can go through it a little bit. <laughs> I wish I could fucking understand it. Well, it's just because I'm going to gloss over it, and that's not the same thing as reading it. Oh, I know. That's why. I mean, I okay, read it. So I read it, and then I read it and took notes here for you. Well, so I literally read it three times in the last two days. Well, you're a lot smarter than me. <laughs> no, I wouldn't say that. I'm just saying. Oh, I would. <laughs> I'm going to touch on high points. It's not the same thing as reading it. Yeah. Well, can we finish it? I'm going to piss Muhammad off. Hold on. Oh, shit, no. You okay? Can mommy hurt you, Bubba? She's 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> what? I'm, I'm gonna send you what I sent him to. I guess I do. <laughs> He's gonna be pissed off. Alright, who you send? I can't receive anything while I'm on the phone. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so I so I just sent him a notice that says uh uh do schedule a meet after having made a PayPal donation. Thank you for your time. <laughs> well I mean we be what does he want from you, you know? Yeah, I'm tired of his crap. Now, when yeah. I talked to him the other day, you know, he's like reminding me that he's not going to pay me anything until he wins or till I cause him to win or till he does this or oh. till I do that. Oh, no, no. Or all kinds of stupid shit. I said, I said, I knew from day one you were never going to pay me. I said, I never had a doubt in my mind. I said, you're a liar. And uh, um, anyway, so he... he's like calling me a government agent and all this crap. Yeah, no, and, I know. Uh, whatever. Okay. Yeah, I was on the now they're just excuses he creates in his mind so that he can, uh, so that he can uh, uh, justify to himself why he doesn't think he owes me anything. <laughs> that was funny. I'm like, do you a government agent? <laughs> I don't know what to say. Oh God, you're fucking cool. mm-hmm. Well, he has, a, he, he has a perverted idea in his brain that um, somehow I accrue value by virtue of him winning. That's not the way the world works. I accrue value by virtue of time or materials or labor or both that I invest into you. It has nothing to How do with winning. Do you get anything if you win? Like, yeah, I mean, in fact, um, in fact, most people don't understand, but it, it's actually against the law for a lawyer to tell you you're going to win. You could literally <laughs> sue him for that, and have him disbarred. He's a fucking retard. He's not allowed to tell you you're going to win. In fact, any lawyer that tells you you have more than a fifty percent chance of winning is a liar. Carl used to do that. Carl would tell people, "Oh yeah." I, this is a slam dunk. Tell him, Bill. And I said, Oh, I can't. I can't, in good conscience, say that. And I would. I would literally tell them. And if any lawyer tells you you have over a fifty percent chance of winning is a liar. Yeah. <laughs> People get angry when I say that, but it's. I can actually show you right in the books where it says that. Oh well, shit! Well, I'm supposed to be fifty percent. It's more like like maybe. <laughs> Should I take yeah, Muhammad's call and eighteen percent? Should I should no. I take Muhammad's call and piss him off? No, I don't want to talk to Muhammad. All right, we'll just. I cannot do this. I cannot do it, man. Oh. Anyway. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> He said, LOL. I said, no joke, man. Hmm. The only joke is you thinking that I'm fucking stupid enough to keep talking to you. <laughs> I'm not your friend. I'm not your neighbor. I'm not your brother. I'm in it to win it. Maybe wow. I was uh, stupid and courteous, but uh, I'm not going to let somebody walk all over me. Hmm. He's uh, a bit much to handle. But um, anyway, we can... Uh, we can go through this a little bit. Uh, it's okay, we can do it tomorrow if you want. No, that's fine. Well, I mean, at some point, you're going to have to go to court. I know, and that's what I am. Um, I'm scared. Don't be scared. I yeah. am. But, I mean, like, I, I can't emphasize enough. I mean, just because we're going to go through this is no substitute for reading it. Okay, now... <laughs> If I, oh God, I'll just read the rest of it and then we'll go through it tomorrow. That way it's all there. I don't want to wait till tomorrow because it's a long time away. I mean, you'll call me about 8 o'clock tomorrow night. 
<laughs> you know what? Let's do it. So anyway here, so if you start out on uh, in the beginning here, take my highlighted copy. Okay. So you, you come up to uh, page 2-1. Um, you probably didn't notice my numbering convention there. <laughs> um, my page numbering convention. <laughs> no. Look at your PDF. Oh, you're on a phone, right? No, I'm on I'm on my computer. Oh yeah, can you you see where the PDF page number is? Um, yeah, twenty three. I'm on right now. That's you see how I named the page? No. <laughs> Where? Go to page okay. three. For example, that's where I'm at. The first page of the book. Gotcha. Which is book page thirteen. But look what I look what the PDF page number is. Are you in reading mode or can you see the PDF page number? Yeah, no, it's my computer's slow. Uh, the PDF page number for page one is one five six four five underscore two dash one. Oh my god! Why? <laughs> Why? <laughs> see. Why do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> my number. All right. So let's look at this a little bit. You on page one? Yes. All right. Parliamentary law and and deliberative assemblies. General definition. Parliamentary law is generally understood to be that system of rules by which deliberative assemblies govern themselves. Sounds like we're creating self-governing people, huh? Hmm. hmm. <laughs> hmm. I've never heard that before. <laughs> Uh, the business of mankind uh, in their public gatherings or assemblies called deliberative bodies. Uh, assemblies of this kind are, tra are to transact business in an orderly, practical. Uh, there must be um, some recognized rules. Uh, if not, no one will know what <laughs> his rights are, nor how. He is to proceed. The beginnings of parliamentary law come from men who met together to transact business. That's what you are. You are men meeting for the transact of business. Okay. You see, everywhere I see the word necessary, I highlight it. You see that on the next page? Mm -hmm. Necessity knows no law. Necessity knows no law. So the rules are there because it became necessary for the guarding of certain liberties and rights of members. The need of officers, the need of rules, the necessariness of them. Uh, because they were necessary, they were few and simple. And they were recognized and agreed to. Very, very important ideas here. Um, first of all, why do we have the rules? To guard liberties and rights. Why do we have the officers and rules? To guard liberties and rights. The rules are simple and few, recognized and agreed to. Those rules which are necessary. Very simple, huh? Yeah. Every assembly would thus be a law unto itself, hence self-governing, would have it its own rules, and just such as it chose to be governed by. Not rules foisted upon it, rules it chose to be governed by. There sprang up a consent among various assemblies as to certain laws. These became a code. The general body of laws for the government of assemblies, vis-a-vis -vis parliamentary law. Parliamentary practice, by extension. 
the English Parliament was uh, eventually um, superseded in America as the de facto parliamentary model by Congress. So in England, they still use par uh, Parliament as their model. Stateside, we use Congress as our model. More specifically, the House of Representatives. It has been challenged to suit the genius and institutions of our country, the tastes and needs of the American people. Which people? The United Statesians? No. The Omens? No. The Californians? No. The Michiganders? No. The American people. Each deliberative body has certain conditions that are peculiar to itself and consequently it may naturally have certain rules which will properly be applicable to it alone. Only the general rules of these bodies that have been formulated into a code, those rules that rest upon general principles. Every assembly a law unto itself, which of course means self-governing. <clears throat> Uh, general principles uh, does not prohibit such an assembly from forming also special laws of its own, as it may please for its own government. Another way to say self-governing. Indeed, the so-called general parliamentary law is only binding in as far as any particular assembly may see fit to recognize it and be bound thereby. Assemblies are generally understood to do this until they see fit to make rules of their own. It is fundamental principle that every deliberative assembly is at liberty to make any rules that it sees fit for its own government in the transaction of business. This is powerful shit. You get that, right? When you're standing in that body that you create in that courthouse, you have the equal right from all bodies in all of history to make whatever rules are relative to the efficient transaction of the business of the day. Those laws... Are you saying, like Carl would say, as, um, as, as the government will do as it sees proper and fit, or proper and uh, We'll get into the minutia in a minute. Um, right. No, you're fine. Th those laws that are made up, made by any particular body for its own special government, are usually called rules. Parliamentary laws is a code of common sense rules. Let me say that again. <laughs> Parliamentary law is a code of common sense rules. Do you know what I just said? Yes. Yeah. What I just said? Uh, is common sense rules for law. No, you can't say what I said. You gotta say it in oh. your own words. Common sense. The, the rules that they're making is just common sense. It's not, it's not anything mm. out of the ordinary. I don't know. The term common sense yeah. is another way to write common law. Oh. Common sense equals common law. It is really a code of common sense rules or laws is another way to say it is really a code of common law, rules, or laws, which have gradually grown up to meet exigencies of deliberative assemblies, such a code of rules as experience has shown to be best. To one who will study it carefully, parliamentary law 
is a beautiful science, as well as a practical code. And there is little excuse for the widespread ignorance of this system found even among intelligent people. This applies, of course, to public assemblies, deliberative assembly, uh, deliberative bodies of all sorts, and assemblies at large. A permanent deliberative body is one which does not propose for itself any dissolution. It is organized with the idea of having a permanent existence. Those which always continue with a sufficient number of members to transact business. The United States Senate is an illustration, state senates also. Those which continue permanently with a form of organization, the United States House of Representatives and the lower branch of state legislatures illustrate this model. Principles of division are permanent assemblies, whether there is always a sufficient number of members left from for the transaction of regular business. Whether there is a constituency or no constituency is not a material point. Occasional deliberative assemblies, being the other's type, are called together temporarily for some special purpose they transact once for all, the business for which they are assembled then adjourn. Those whose members represent constituencies, therefore, require credentials, constitutional conventions, political conventions, councils, a council called to organize a church or to ordain a minister are illustrations of this model. Those whose members do not represent any constituency, so do not need any credentials. The members are simply present as the result of some kind of call. Each one represents himself only. That is to say, any kind of mass meeting. Uh, principal division is based upon whether there is or is not a constituency. Strictly speaking, it is not. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> um, moving on, of course, um, the organization of deliberative assemblies. Uh, uh, the first application of parliamentary law must naturally be the organization of an assembly. Until a body is organized for business, no business of any kind can be properly transacted. <clears throat> The first and most important rule or law applicable to the organization of a deliberative assembly is the pending organization. Nothing is in order except what is germane to organization. When organized, an assembly is organized when it has a president and a secretary. Only a president and a secretary are actually necessary to an organization. Such bodies are organized um, as permanent assembly uh, the same way uh, the same way uh, the same way uh, as organ uh, occasional bodies would be organized. Uh, if there's a law that it must follow, it must follow it literally. The officers uh, previously elected continue in their office until their successors are elected. The president will call the body to order. If there is any religious exercise, it should come at this point. Call for prompt roll of names made out by the secretary. The secretary will read the list. The body is ready to proceed to the election of other officers. Any number of nominations may be made. Anyone may make a motion to close the nominations. <clears throat> president will order the vote taken. The president may take it as he sees fit. The body may determine this by special vote. 
proceed with the election of the secretary. As soon as the presiding officer learns the result of the election of the president, it is his duty to announce the result as uh, and to have uh, the newly elected president take the chair. The newly elected president will then complete the organization of the assembly. The former president is pre uh, <clears throat> the former president is present. The first business will be the election of a temporary secretary. If the president and secretary, uh, if the president is absent, then the highest uh, vice president will sit. Um, if they are both absent, then the secretary will assume the chair. If none, then you'll proceed to electing temporary officers. Occasional bodies are arranged in a similar way. When there is no credentials, um, someone rises and calls uh, the meeting to order. He may, if he wishes, state why they have assembled. Others may rise and address the first speaker. And when recognized by him, make other nominations. When the nominations are all in, the person acting as spokesman or president pro tem will take the vote on the nominations. The vote must be taken uh, on the names and in, in the order in which the nominations have been made until someone has a majority. The person receiving a majority of all the votes should be immediately invited by temporary chairman to take the chair and complete the organization. He does this by calling the nominations for the other officers, putting the question upon the nominations, and declaring the result of the votes, and calling upon those elected to take their places. When there are credentials, uh, uh, here there will be held first an election for temporary officers, and some members will move the Hello. Are you there? Hello. Hello. Yeah, don't hang up. Okay. <laughs> I had to mute my phone because the house phone was ringing. Um, then some members will move the appointment uh, of a committee on credentials. Those claiming the right of membership, the right to membership, will be asked to hand in their credentials. The committee will then retire and consider these credentials and prepare a report on the same and offer this report through the chair uh, to the body as soon as possible. It is usual also to appoint a committee to nominate. Uh, permanent officers, not necessary. Religious uh, exercises uh, may take place um, after the um, report of the committee on the credentials has been made uh, and acted upon. The next business in order will be the election of the permanent officers and permanent organization. If this report is adopted, the temporary uh, chairman uh, will in Hello. Um, will invite the officers elected to take their places and the temporary officers will retire. It is usual to appoint someone to conduct the elected president to the chair. The body is now ready for business being fully organized. Uh, permanent organization. Uh, then we'll look at credentials. Um, before we get into credentials, though, let's back up a minute. Okay. You, you should have uh, uh, noticed that um, what we're talking about here, when you go into the place of meeting, you guys will be electing to organize yourself into 
a, an occasional assembly with credentials. Okay. Does that make sense to you? Based on what I've read so far? Um, like a meeting, yeah, but credentials as in... Well, yeah, because obviously there are very stringent rules about who gets to sit in the high chair. Okay. And who gets to prosecute and, and whom they get to prosecute. So not just anyone can occupy those offices. Since they are all credentialed offices, before you guys can organize yourself into a permanent uh, body, albeit occasional body, um, you have to validate the credentials. The oath of office? Yeah, absolutely. Any any credentials, the oaths, the bonds, um, uh, foreign agent registration, uh, if he has to be licensed to carry a gun, uh, how did they get their star? One of the requirements to, to even sit in any of the three offices is you have to be a, a man of good moral standing. You literally have to have a certificate of good moral standing. And I, incidentally, I'll have you draft one as well. Um, it's a good place to start. Um, we'll draft that tonight. But you see, what well, before you can organize yourself, you have to you have to qualify the credentials. So again, we're speaking to jurisdiction, right? Yeah. We're saying um, we we would love to organize and meet and conduct business. However, as we are each required to demonstrate credentials, and I haven't witnessed your credentials. Um, I'm afraid we can't proceed past that point at this time. Is that literally what I'm going to say? Absolutely. Why not? Oh, my God. Let's talk a little bit better. Yeah, let's, let's look at credentials for a minute. What are, what are credentials? Credentials are the letters or credentials are the letters or evidence that one can give of his right to be a member of the assembly. There is no difference in essential principle between permanent or occasional bodies as to the rules applicable to credentials. Only in permanent assemblies, as we have seen, the older officers act as the temporary officers. Need for credentials. In some assemblies, the matter of credentials is very important in order to prevent unauthorized persons from getting into the assembly and influencing or controlling its actions. Religious assemblies generally don't concern with credentials, although they may. The rules of credentials. When credentials are required, they must be inquired into before the election of permanent officers. For there is no purpose that can be served by credentials more important than that of determining who may take part in the organization of the assembly. If laws are to be followed, they must be literally obeyed. Now, of course, I'm paraphrasing right there, but what they're actually saying in the in the black letter is uh, is uh, if there's a constitution, if there's bylaws, if there's uh, any organic law, if there's a statute, if there's any body, any organized body above this assembly that can rule upon it, then you must heed to those rulings. In religious assemblies, there are various methods as to credentials, letters from the churches, name the delegates. Those so named take their seats by virtue of being so named unless objection is raised. There being, of course, no danger of fraud, it, it, it is customary to let all who claim seats simply announce or hand in their names. Such announcement is taken as prima facie evidence of the right to seats the body proceeds to its permanent organization 
if the objection is raised, the credential must be carefully examined. Uh, sometimes the appointment by some authorized board is the credential that is required. When for any reason special inquiry needs to be made as to credentials, the proper way is for some one to move the appointment of a committee on credentials and in motion he may make any other suggestion he may see fit to make as to the appointment of the committee. The president should put the motion to the House as it has been made. When such a committee is appointed, it should take charge of the whole matter of credentials. Uh, credentials, facts, uh, entitled to seats, rival claims, investigation. Uh, in case any member is not satisfied with the report of the committee, he may offer a motion in assembly by vote. In case the report is adverse to anyone's claim to the seat, the party who claim whose claim is disputed should be heard by the assembly in his defense. He should remain silent unless invited to speak again. In no event should he vote upon his own case. In all cases of contests, only those who vote whose right to seats is not questioned. Now we'll pause there for a minute and take a closer look at this credential business. So you understand what's going on here, right? They're requiring their credentials. They very clearly point out from the most ancient laws of organized meetings among men that the very first thing is to establish credentials where credentials are necessary. In your occasional meeting of your assembly, credentials are absolutely necessary. So you must raise that issue very quickly because you have the you have the power to cure defects okay not the prosecutor not the presiding officer you have the power to cure defects what that means is if you don't raise this issue it's not an issue mm -hmm. Because you acquiesce after the fact. Because you're allowed to do that. Not the prosecutor and not the presiding officer, but you are allowed to do that. Now that can be a good thing or a bad thing. Generally, it works out to be a very bad thing for most people. Why? Well, because most people have no clue what they're allowing to transpire. Just like all the rules a, a policeman can break on the side of the road, he can't do them if you hold his feet to the fire. But most people don't understand that, so they just let him get away with highway robbery. Literally. <laughs> um, so again, we're reminded that uh, um, the proper way to question credentials is to... Uh, immediately question them so you, you you know so when you uh, start your meet when you get a chance to speak right off the bat if you if you're not given the floor first then you need to steal the floor you need to be very uh aggressive but not uh, not offensive like i told you the other day you need to say for example um if the floor is given to the prosecutor first, you need to interject. You need to like clear your throat or whatever. Stand and rise and raise your hand and clear your throat. And say, <coughs> um, excuse me. Do not proceed with your discussion because you, you don't want to offend the presiding officer. But no one can speak in a body until they've been given the floor. So what you're doing is you're pushing your way onto the floor, but you don't want to go so far as to offend the presiding officer or the body at large. 
She just, you know, you clear your throat, raise your hand, spit at the guy. I don't know. Um, get his attention. Jump up and down or something. <laughs> Say, uh, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. You know, and, and wait for him to give you the floor. He'll say something like uh, your name or he'll say something like um, he'll look at you and say, is there something you wanted to add before we get started? And you can you then then, you know, he's passed you the baton. You, you now have the talking stick. You get to speak. Um, yeah. And, and uh, I would strongly urge you to I would strongly urge you to filibuster at that point. Just do not fucking quit speaking until they take you to the gallow. <laughs> yeah. No. Don't what? do the unrevealed contract crap. Okay, okay, okay. No, you can, but um, that's fine. But you want to stick to higher arguments like um, it's my true belief, and the Supreme Court of the United States of America has confirmed that I. Your fellow man am not bound by the institutions of my fellow man. You could start out with that. That's very powerful saying uh, middle finger in the air, motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, because uh, because uh, as soon as you tell the judge you're not bound by any of the institutions of your fellow man and the Supreme Court believes that, too. Um, he's bound by the determinations of the Supreme Court. So now he's bound by that statement. Okay, so, so where does he go from there? <laughs> where does he take it from there? He can't. How's he going to make you bound by something you're not bound by, by virtue of the Supreme Court of the United States of America? You're basically, you're saying, like we did with that girl, you're basically saying, hey, your boss said this, so sit down and shut up. <laughs> That's basically what you're telling the judge now. <laughs> and he'll probably react in kind. But now, now, so you're going to, uh, of course, you're going to um, go after credential. Now let's look at quorum for a minute. Um, the quorum is a number agreed upon or provided for in some other way as necessary to be present. Okay, so the quorum is a number necessary to be present in a deliberative assembly in order to transact business. A sufficient number ought to be present to give authority and weight to the decisions reached. Now, before I proceed, let me say very quickly here. This is where I tell you, see, the defendant is never required except in a, except in a, a capital murder case. They're never required to be there? The constitution protects your right to be there in a criminal case okay. but they can't even conduct a capital murder case without the defendant but in most cases like 99 percent of cases you don't need a defendant to conduct court generally speaking That's kind of generally speaking if you have a prosecutor and since it's his court you have court um, like I said, there are exceptions, of course, but basically, so you need a prosecutor. You can't have court without a prosecutor, and generally you need a presiding officer because somebody has to slam the gavel. Yeah, they try to have five-year-olds do it, but it's not as much fun. <laughs> um. So this is why you're challenging credentials in the first place. As soon as you get one of these three officers kicked off the bench, then you can't conduct trial. Right? You yeah. can't go forward with the case because you no longer have a quorum. Now, I will also yeah. tell you, in a common law court proceeding, the bailiff is required to be the sheriff. So if any time you think you may not be in a common law court, you can just ask the judge. Um, for the record, is this bailiff present here today, is he the sheriff? <clears throat> and he'll just simply say yes or no after the judge gives him leave to speak. The thing is, 
If he's not, then you know it's impossible for you to be in a common law court proceeding. So then you can take all the mystery out of it. A lot of these people get so wound up in, oh, is this true? Is that true? Is something else true? These things are all very simple to sort out like I've shown you before. So if you can disqualify the judge or the prosecutor or yourself, maybe you're not such a person as belongs in this body. Well, see, you're appearing as a man, right? Yes, you are. Yes, I said yes. Since you're appearing as a man, law can only entertain creatures of its own make. So law requires all three officers to be persons. The immediate question should be, since you're not qualified to be there, you don't have a quorum. But you don't want to start there because, again, you're the okay. defense. They don't need you. So you want to start by picking on them. You want to mm -hmm. say, okay, I want to see your guys' oaths and bonds and all other pertinent credentials. Oh my god, Billy. I'm going to have to fucking have this scripted out. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Don't worry. Don't worry. You can start writing it the day after court. That's what Mike did. Shut up. <laughs> so I'm writing it right now, but it's going to Okay. In, in, many, in many deliberative bodies, in many bodies, the quorum is fixed and is so in all legislative bodies. Any deliberative body may fix by a rule of its own the quorum when the same is not otherwise fixed by higher law. When not so fixed by law or special rule, it requires a majority of the enrolled members to make a quorum. So basically the common sense rule, or if we will say the common law de facto rule is 50% plus one. Um, Legislative assemblies, the quorum consists, if not otherwise provided for, of a majority of those who ought to have been elected, and not simply a majority of those actually in attendance. So if your body consists of a hundred people and only 20 of them came to the meeting, the quorum is based on the hundred, not on the 20. This is especially true of many religious organizations. Uh, uh, no business can be conducted without a quorum. No business can be engaged in if it is known that a quorum is not present. Known being the, known being the, known being the, the operative word. If business is in progress, it should stop immediately. When it is ascertained that no quorum is present, I will stop you there for a minute and inform you. This is why it's very important what you're going to do. Immediately, you're going to call attention to the fact that you have not proved credentials for the necessary officers. Or you can say members, or you can say you and you, <laughs> pointing at them. <laughs> mm -hmm. Since you haven't proved credentials, they're not qualified to sit. You don't have a quorum. By the rules, you cannot proceed any further if it becomes known that there's not a quorum. So you know it. So you need to speak it. You need to say, it is my true belief we do not have a quorum for conducting business here today because you and you have not proved qualifications to sit. I move immediately for discharge and relief. <laughs> See, you say you want it to be simple. I've shown you probably 50 ways you can dispose of your case in one sentence or less. How much simpler can we make it? really work. They're just going to go, okay, all right, yeah, yeah, all right, proceed. Reality is what you believe in your mind. You you create the prison you live in. A smaller number than a quorum may adjourn from time to time until a quorum is secured. So even though you don't have a quorum to conduct business, you still do have 
a necessary number for adjournment. Even one officer can adjourn. If the judge doesn't go there, even the clerk has the power to adjourn the recorder. Um, incidentally, some courts you'll find only one person there besides the prosecutor. Don't be fooled by that. That doesn't that doesn't frustrate the rule of a president and a secretary because the president and secretary can be two offices occupied by the same person. Let me say that a little differently. Uh -huh. <laughs> the presiding officer can operate every office in his courtroom, not the bailiff. So if you had if you had a need for 20 officers in there and a bailiff, then the presiding officer can operate all 20 offices, but not the bailiff. The, off the presiding officer cannot be a bailiff in his own courtroom. The presence or absence of a quorum is usually ascertained by roll call. It ought always to be so settled, the proper method of ascertaining the presence of a quorum. The chair is not bound to take notice of the absence of a quorum. Unless his attention is called to the matter. And understand that. So the presiding officer doesn't have to notice that he's the only one in the room. He can still conduct the entire affair even though he's the only one standing there. Uh -huh. Exactly. What a joke, huh? Uh -huh. But as soon as you point out to him, as soon as you say, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you uh, can you see the prosecutor isn't even in the room? Uh -huh. Then he, he can't he can't ignore it, but he's under new, no duty to to discover that on his own. Does that make sense? Uh -huh. This would, in many cases, be very onerous to the chair and very uh, uh, undesirable to the body. A quorum is always supposed to be present unless attention is called to the contrary. Even vote after vote may be taken where a quorum does not vote and still a quorum is supposed to be present until someone raises the point of no quorum. And they cite case precedent for that. The point is, um, until somebody uh, actually says, um, you realize I'm the only one here, right? <laughs> No one has to, no one has, they can still con continue pretending that they still have a full body of all 300 members sitting in front of them. What a scam, huh? Mm -hmm. You know, lawyers and politicians think this shit up. Mm -hmm. The principle of a quorum should not be violated, even in religious bodies. The principle of a quorum should always be observed. No important business should be transacted until a reasonable number of the members can be gotten together. This is true of bodies religious and not religious. It is far better to adjourn. If violated, however, a larger number can at any time reconsider or repeal the objectionable action. In bodies where many members leave before the close, it is usual it is usually wise not to raise the question. This is especially true of many religious gatherings. The reason is uh, no one wants to ask the elephant, in the, no one wants to address the elephant in the room, right? No one wants to say, uh, <laughs> uh, how did we just pass this tax bill when only 10 of us are on the floor? <laughs> as soon as you ask the question, it can't be avoided. So it's one of those things that uh, everyone wants to pretend like they don't see it. <laughs> now, as to the president, um, you know, uh, to be a good presiding uh, officer, um, one should be, should have quick perception, good judicial mind, judicial mind, be able to quickly uh see all points involved, decide fairly upon all questions. Uh, he should be entirely impartial in all his rulings. Try to give uh, to everyone his rights. Um, he should be thoroughly familiar 
with the law by which the body is to be governed. Uh, a man of even temper, be at all times gentlemanly uh, in his bearing towards uh, everyone. Thus avoid all friction in his management of his body. A uh, Have tact. Above all, he should be a man of promptness and firmness in all decisions. And they go on to say how um, it's better that he's absolutely prompt and, and decisive than it is for him to be even modicomly uh, wishy-washy. The, president, the presiding officer must be present. Mu the presiding officer must be president while he presides. That's a mouthful. If the president is wrong in any decision, it can be easily corrected by appeal or otherwise. Um, uh, it is his duty to take the chair promptly at his appointed time and call the meeting to order uh, in case there is any prescribed or customary way of opening the meeting. He should see that this is done in the proper way. When the meeting has been properly called to order and is ready for business, he should ask the pleasure of the body or wait for someone to introduce business. Call attention to any matter of business that he knows to be pending. Call attention to any matter that is uh, that it is his duty to mention. And then ask, what is the pleasure of the body? When any business is presented, it is the duty of the president to see that the matter uh, gets before the house in the proper form. And that all proceedings are in accordance with the parliamentary law that governs the body. He should allow no one to offer any motion or make any remarks until duly recognized by the chair. Remember we discussed that a minute ago? Uh -huh. You can't just blurt shit out because the body uh -huh. will totally ignore you. Uh -huh. He must preserve order. He must preserve order. That's where his right, his right to holding contempt comes from. Mm. See, unless you knew these elements, you wouldn't see them in here. <laughs> That's actually where his right to hold you in contempt comes from. That mm. one phrase right there, he must preserve order. He must protect every member in all his rights. So you can literally quote language from here if you want to stand on language from here to make your case. Um, he must answer promptly all questions, parliamentary law. When necessary, rule firmly upon all such questions. He, now, this is very important. He is not bound to answer, and usually he should not answer any questions that are not strictly questions of parliamentary law. So, just think of your presiding officer as a parliamentarian. He's just like a referee with a whistle. Neither is it in his province to sit in judgment upon the good tastes of others. The president who confines himself strictly to the duties of enforcing parliamentary law is always the most successful, most satisfactory presiding officer. And when we talk about the privileges and uh, rights of the president, it's interesting to note that uh, the president does not, in, by reason of being president, forfeit any of his rights as a member of the body. He can sit at any time and call someone else to the chair and take his place upon the floor as a private member in all of his rights that any other member has. He should keep himself as far as possible from everything like uh, partisanship as, uh, uh, as to any mem measure. So, um, Understand there's two different characters he's operating. He's operating a character, he's operating an office of a member, and he's operating an office of a president or chair or presiding officer. So when he's sitting in the chair, so in your case, when, when the presiding officer is sitting in the high chair, then he is not sitting in the role of a member. He's sitting as you know, as the chair. But um if he wants to if he wants to participate in the action on the floor, he needs to appoint somebody else to sit in the chair. 
And this is one one way you can grade him if he uh, if he tries to do this when he's sitting in the chair. You can say, uh, uh, you know, like sometimes maybe he'll seem partial to the prosecution. Uh-huh. You can just interject and say, "Excuse me, if you want to participate in the action of the floor, I strongly urge you to call someone else to sit in the chair." Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, that's a huge kick in the balls, but you're going to put him immediately on notice that you're not somebody to be trifled with, that you fully understand the mechanics of the meeting before you, and that you're not to be uh, bullied about. You're going to hold him to the letter of the rule, and and you don't expect anything less of him. Um, Huh? Yeah. <laughs> when he does this, um, he should always call someone else to the chair. No president has the right, no president has the right to remain in the chair while trying to forward his own views on any disputed case. Um, he need not leave the chair uh, to discuss an appeal. He should usually not vote on any question except in case of a tie vote. He is expected by reason of his office to vote in cases of a tie. He may, however, even then refuse to vote if he so desires, in which case the measure fails for lack of majority. Still, the president has the right to vote on any measure if he so chooses. Now we talk about the secretary being the other only other necessary officer. The secretary also should be fairly well acquainted with the parliamentary law, especially with all the laws pertaining to his official duties. A man of quick perception so as to be able to catch readily and accurately motions, motions, motions that are not put into writing. Uh, by the mover. Now, I call your attention to motions, of course. When you speak something on the record in a law court, you have to speak it three times. But I call your attention here to motions because the mover moves motions. Um, The mover moves court. The secretary should be able to express himself in clear and accurate language, a quick reader of manuscript and a good and impressive reader before the body. Be able to also to keep record in easily legible handwriting that anyone may easily gather from his minutes just what the body has meant to put to record. Uh, Be one who will do the willing and promptly anything that is required of him in the line of his duty as a secretary he undertakes to be a true servant of the body Uh, always be at his desk when the meeting is called to order keep an exact an exact record of every motion that receives a majority vote and of all business that is accurately transacted by the body whether by motion or otherwise In some bodies, he is required to keep a record of all motions and all business proposed. Take charge of all lists of committees. Be ready at all reasonable times to give information to any member of the body as to the matter of business of which he is required to keep a record. Take charge of all papers turned over to him by the president or by the body and be ready to produce such papers at any time when they may be properly called for. No one has a right, no one has any right to withdraw papers from his keeping except in accordance with the rules of the body or upon the consent of the secretary. Uh, Record of proceedings uh, and as do all papers entrusted to him. In fact, as to everything pertaining to his work as a secretary and the rights and privileges of the secretary. It is as true of the secretary as the president, blah, blah, blah. None of his rights and as a member uh, by reason of his holding office 
in the service of the body are forfeited. He has the right to vote on all questions. He need not leave his desk to take part in any of the proceedings of the body unless he desires so to do. You can have multiple secretaries. Um, all offices under the presiding office can be multiplied um, as necessary by the assembly. When a deliberate body um, elects uh, vice presidents, one or more of these ought to be elected with a view to his being able to take the chair and preside over the assembly in case the president should at any time vacate the chair. Members of the deliberative body, rights and duties. Rights and obligations. It is important each member should understand his rights as a member of the body. And more important still, that he should understand his duties or obligations. It is important each member should understand his rights as a member of the body. That's an important idea, you see, because most people don't understand their rights. And so they don't even understand when they've been trespassed against. Rights of members, equality. All members upon the floor of the body have equal rights and are entitled to equal privileges and consideration from the officers and other members. That's basically saying the judge doesn't get treated special just because he gets to sit in a high chair, and the prosecutor doesn't get to be treated special just because he has a tin star. You are all equal in the eyes of the body, and to be treated so. Right to introduce or dis Gus measures each member, each member, each member has the right to introduce any measure to the attention of the body and to discuss the same. If it is a deliberate, if it is a debatable question and to use all parliamentary means for securing the end which he may have in view. Each member, each member is entitled to be protected by the president and by the body in the exercise and enjoyment of all his rights and privileges as a member of the body. You're an American. You're protected by the Constitution of the United States and the Bill of Rights anywhere on earth, which by extension also give you the privileges and immunities of all your rights ever. Privileges and immunities can protect your common law rights. They can protect your God-given rights. They can protect your inherent rights. They can protect your political rights, your legal rights, your statutory rights. They can protect your ancient rights, your common rights, your new rights, your old rights, all rights can be protected under the Privileges and Immunities Clause, even your natural rights. It was a genius thing the founders did by uh, coding that into the Constitution, a clever method for uh, securing your natural rights, which hitherto, therefore, were not protected by law. Um, they were able to codify them in the Declaration and then preserve a method for utilizing that codification in the Constitution. Very genius. They kind of snuck that in there and see, most people still don't know the true awesomeness of that clause. The Supreme Court, of course, does and have many times articulated that end. Each member is entitled to be protected by the President and by the body in the exercise and enjoyment of all his rights and privileges as a member of the body and therefore to be protected against all discourtesy and all infringements upon his rights. Now, if you only looked up two words from this article, discourtesy and infringement are excellent words to learn. Very brilliant words you can employ into your articulations. <clears throat> discourtesy and infringement. For this purpose, the member may rise at any 
time to a question of personal privilege and courteous and courteously demand. Now that's cleverly worded. Courteously oh. demand. See, that's what you're going to do when you clear your throat. Like I said, he's going to give the floor to the prosecutor, but you need to speak before the prosecutors. You just rise and raise your hand and, and stand, stand up and say, <clears throat> <laughs> you're courteously demanding. And then when the judge speaks, addresses you, we can say, um, yes, there's something you wanted to add before we proceed. You can say, um, yes, actually, um, I'm rising to a point of personal privilege. Blah, blah, blah. Because nobody can have a higher position than a personal privilege except for the motion to demand. Excuse me, the motion to adjourn. The motion of adjournment is the only position you can take above personal privilege. So literally, you can, you can move to that end at any moment, no matter who has the floor. Technically, you would not be out of line, no matter who was speaking. Okay, so uh, blah, 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 blah. Therefore, to be protected against all discourtesy and all infringement upon his rights, for this purpose, the member may rise at any time. To, question, to a question of personal privilege and courteously demand that he be protected in the enjoyment of his rights and privileges as a member of the body. Nothing but a motion to adjourn can interfere with his right uh, of a member to rise and claim his personal rights. Now also understand the first five amendments of the Bill of Rights um, the first five articles of the Bill of Rights are all personal privileges. They're all personal rights um, that are secured to you. So all of those you can assert at any time, even at time, even at time, even at time. The courteous interruption of others. <clears throat> If the chair refuses to protect him, he may appeal to the body. He has, however, no right to resist a decision made by the body except by withdrawal from the membership. Um, each member should show the utmost respect and courtesy to the officers of the body. If a member is dissatisfied with the conduct of any officer, he may, in a respectful way, appeal to the body. Disrespect to an officer is disrespect to the body. Every member should be careful of the rights of fellow members. He should treat them with every courtesy and consideration, avoiding everything like unparliamentary language and all infringements upon their privileges. Each member should refrain from doing anything in violation either of the rules of the body or of the general parliamentary law recognized by the body. Each member should promptly and cheerfully submit to all decisions of the body. Other rights and duties of members may be gathered from the chapter on debates. Before we go further, I would just want to say real quick, um, this is probably one of the most important chapters, this chapter five that we just looked at that you could possibly study in this in this segment. Awesome. Um I'm sure there was something else really important I wanted to say too, but I'm trying to think about that, right? Um <laughs> uh there was something I wanted to show you that was very clever right there. Now I can't. Oh, yeah. So, see, this is one thing. Uh, hopefully, you've, you've gathered this from my reading already. But um, this is where most people go astray in their goofiness. See, they say, um, you know, they might go in there and they say, oh, uh, I'm a man, you know. And they say, uh, oh, you, you can't be a man because, um, you know, uh, you know. Uh, you're not hurt. You can't be hurt by the body once you're a man, right? Say so they go in there and say they'll say this "I man" shit, right? 
I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. And uh, the, the first thing you, you might notice is every one of these sentences start out by a member, each member, each member, each member. You getting the point there? All members. If you're not a member of the body, you can't be heard. So remember, a legal society creates persons. You control what you create. A legal society does not create mans. So when a man okay. appears before the legal society, um, he can't be heard by the legal society because they didn't create him. Um, we're told uh, in another Supreme Court case that the government being fictional can only address other fictions. Um, that's another case I set up for you to use in your in your your situation too. How would you go about then speaking to them if you can't be heard? You speak from a, a place out of bar, remember? Okay. Because you're out of bar, gotcha. you're not part of the proceeding anyway. Gotcha. And if you can speak out of bar and show how they can't even organize because they can't create a quorum because they're uncredentialed, there's, it's game over. It's checkmate before they even get to move upon. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Now, when we look lastly at the conduct of business, and this will go by really quick, but this is probably another one of the most important chapters here. Five and six, if you just read five and six over and over and over ad nauseum, you probably, that's all you'd need to get out of this. But um, all the material we've covered thus far is amazingly important. However, now you're going to learn how to conduct business. Thus far, we've established an organization, we've organized an organization, we've peopled the organization, we've credentialed the officers, we've established the officers, and now we're ready to conduct business. Now let's talk about business. We've thus far seen how a deliberative body is organized and equipped for attention to business. We should now proceed to the, consider the method by which its business is conducted. First, the proper manner of introducing any matter upon which action is desired. What? Any matter which action uh -huh. Okay. Um, obtaining the floor. One must obtain the floor before anyone can introduce any matter of business in a deliberative body or claim the attention of the body for any purpose. He must first obtain the floor. Without properly obtaining the floor, he is out of order. And the presiding officer will bring this to your attention by smashing his gavel a few times and then throwing it at you and saying, you're out of order. <laughs> the president or the presiding officer should require him to desist. It is perhaps true and more of the disorder and confusion of deliberative bodies is due to the violation of this order than any other cause. How obtained? For any purpose whatsoever. He must rise and address the chair. In your case, you might humbly say presiding officer um, to avoid those other anachronisms. Or address the chair in any way that is customary in the body. If the president recognizes him by calling his name or by introducing in any way that he may proceed, um, such and one has the floor and may proceed to introduce any matter of business. These are motions. If the presiding officer himself wishes to bring any proper communication to the attention of the body or to call attention to any matter, he has only to judge as to the proper time and ask the attention of the body to what he has to lay before it. For 
This purpose he may, if he thinks best, interrupt one who has the floor. So don't be surprised if sometimes when you're speaking, the judge wants to talk and he just talks over you because he'll do that and he'll look at you very crossly if you don't shut up and let him talk. <laughs> Trust me, I know from experience. <laughs> and if you're not getting the message, he will actually say things like, <clears throat> you don't mind if I speak once in a while, do you? Trust me, I know from experience. <laughs> Uh, he should be very careful in doing this, lest he be guilty of discourtesy. There's our word again. Look it up. Learn it. Impress it upon your mind. Use it in your meeting on the 31st. Possibly provoke an appeal to the house against his intrusion. So even if the presiding officer is discourteous to you, you can still bring attention to that. You can, after the meet, you can file a paper against him and say, hey, that man was discourteous to me. Hmm. People don't understand how, what a huge, huge, huge pedestal they stand on when they assume these government positions, these public offices. It's not because he's a judge, it's because he's in public. When you're in public, you cannot offend people, you cannot be discourteous to them in any way, shape, or form within that definition. If, however, he desires to bring before the body any business in which he is personally interested, he should call someone else to the chair. We discussed that a little bit earlier. Take his chances of obtaining the floor, just like other members have to do. Outside parties, outside parties have no right to the floor. Each member may act in such matters entirely upon his own judgment. Now, lastly, we'll look at motions. Wait, wait. Outside parties, I would be out of bar. <laughs> Outside parties cannot be heard by the floor. See, that's why when you're speaking out of bar and you're standing there and you're standing there in your character as a man, they can't hear you. Mm -hmm. They won't acknowledge you. Just be as if a nothing. But that's all right. It will still have a pressing effect upon them. Because even though they can't hear you, it doesn't mean they won't hear you. Your words will still go into their ears. It will still cause an effect upon them. Even though in contemplation of law, they can't hear you. They're still humans. <laughs> they can't. They can't plug their ears just because in contemplation of law, they can't hear you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Hold on a second. I know that they uh, ignored me last time I spoke. Are you there? Now, what do you say? Uh... <laughs> Nothing. What did you say? I said, I know that uh, this is exactly what they do. They pretend like I wasn't even there. Well, yeah, they're going to pretend. And, and, of course, in contemplation of law, they can't hear you because of the separation doctrine. We covered that in another audio. I mean, if they didn't hear me, it's because they never heard my father before me. Right? Mm -hmm. They hear me. If they hear not me, then they are not my brethren. We are not. We are not one people. I'm a child of God. If they cannot hear me, they're obviously not a child of God. <laughs> there's nothing There's nothing we need to discuss because we can't transact business because we are different people. Separation principle. <clears throat> Your only reason for attendance is because the attendance of your person has been requested. So you got to drag your person in there. So you take in your t-shirt and you hold it up and say, the person is here and point to your t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> what does the person have to say? Well, fuck if I know. <laughs> Persons don't speak. Mans have vocal cords. Would you know what his man wants to say? 
<laughs> middle finger in the air. <laughs> okay, motions. Matters are introduced by means of motions after one has obtained the floor. He introduces any matter of business for the consideration or action of the body by what is called a motion. He uses such language as, I move. I desire to make a motion. I move the following. I move the adoption of the following. I move, blah, blah, blah. I offer. Very often the word motion is not used at all. Yet a motion is actually involved. He is in some way moves, starts, puts in motion something on its way through the body. One may without any motion call the attention of the assembly to a matter. Incidentally, that's how people do notices. Yeah. But when a matter is introduced for consideration or for action upon it by a body, it must, it must, it must be done by means of a motion. All motions are really motions. All motions that are really motions require a second act. Attention of a deliberative body ought not to be asked to any matter where only one of the body is willing to ask for the attention. Seconding is done by phrases such as, I second the motion, I second it, seconded. Now, um, the member seconding a motion need not rise or address the chair or be recognized by the chair for this purpose. I second uh, is good enough. All motions must be put in writing if required by the presiding officer or the secretary or by any member. So literally, you can at some point say, um, as we continue this exercise, I would like to see all motions reduced to writing. <laughs> That's literally, you're right. One of them. So, interestingly enough here, um, uh, when you talk about motions and moving the court, uh, so a after you've obtained the floor, you may introduce any matter of business for consideration. But, uh, see, many people want to put in notices of the wazoo. I notice you that I picked my nose this morning. I notice you that I have three car tires instead of four. Um, Notices are fine for creating attention, but they don't move the court to any end. And then they don't understand why they can't accomplish anything in court. A court only does two things. A court creates a record. And a court is moved to action. Those are the only two things done in court. And, of course, we're not going to get into the two functions of court, which you're well aversed. I move this court to dismiss. What's that now? Did I move this court to dismiss? Yeah, but you, you know what the two functions of court, you recall them, right? Yes. Tell us. Rights for rights and things for rights. Amen, brother. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> My sister. Okay. Re <laughs> resolutions, orders, petitions, bills, and acts. A deliberative body may express its decisions in the form of a resolution, an order, a petition, a bill, or an act. The motion may be for either of these. So. You can use a motion to establish any of those types of devices. A resolution, strictly speaking, every decision of a deliberative body is a resolution. That is something which is resolved. 
But a common use a resolution means a formal expression of opinion upon a subject. Which expression of opinion is presented as the decision of the body? I move the adoption of the following resolution. Resolutions are, however, all all ways offered thus formally. I move that it be the sense of the body. I move that blah, blah, blah. So what, what you need to understand right here, what they're saying is, is very interesting. Strictly speaking, every decision of a deliberative body is a resolution. A resolution means an opinion upon a subject. A motion may be used to create a resolution, an order, a petition, a bill, or an act. These are, strictly speaking, all resolutions. A resolution is an opinion upon a subject. It's all just somebody's fucking opinion. Mm. <laughs> so it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> mm. Thank you for your two cents. Yeah, I'm sorry you feel that way, but I'm going home now. Okay. An order is a command. A petition. Now, incidentally, when you start a case, like a complaint is a petition. If, however, any action upon it by the body is desired, a motion will have to be concerned. Uh will have to be made concerning it, and the body will have to act on the motion. See, you start a lawsuit with a petition, but the body can't act on the petition. It, it needs You need to move the body to act. Okay, a bill or act. If the deliberative body is a legislative body, if the thing which is moved for adoption is in the nature of a proposed statute or law, it is called a bill. When passed by the body, it is called an act. All resolutions, orders, petitions, and bills must be presented in writing. <laughs> is that why it's called the Bill of Rights? Because unless you motion to use it, then it's nothing. Right? Wait, what? Am I confused here? Yeah, no, no, yeah, yeah, you didn't say that correctly, but um, oh, no, that's fine. It, it, the Bill of Rights is a special type of tool, though. Um, it's known, it, it operates in the nature of a codicil against the Constitution. So, actually, the proper way to read the Constitution and the Bill of Rights is to set the Bill of Rights above the Constitution because contracts are always read top down. Since the Bill of Rights has more power than the Constitution and negates anything otherwise in the Constitution, then it must be read first and above the Constitution. Motherfuck. What is meant by the question? The question. The question. You'll hear a lot of the higher courts, especially the appellate courts, will say this all the time. The question before us is... The only question we are to entertain, the questions we are to entertain are, so now you know where that comes from, that language. Okay, the question. It is the duty of the chair to repeat, reread the proposition or to have it read by the secretary. The question is about the adoption of the following motion. Mr. A moves the following. The question is upon its adoption. The question is upon the adoption of the question. The proposition which has been made to the body now takes the form of a question upon which an answer decision must be rendered. So when you take the floor and you move the court to some end, You'll often hear the judge restate what you said. You say, uh, Mr. Presiding Officer, I move the court to raise the thermostat by one degree as that will positively influence the affirmative outcome of my case. <laughs> You'll often hear the presiding officer repeat it back to you saying, uh, if I understand you correctly, you wish to adjust the thermostat by one degree in the positive. 
Now, he's not saying that to mock you or because he's retarded. He's saying that, as you can see, because that's a function of his duties. He must state what you stated to make sure everyone understands the same thing. It may be said to have been properly introduced for the consideration of the body. It is then in the hands of the body awaiting its action upon it before the body. Called the main question. Because you may adopt other ancillary questions uh, 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 as you need to explore the details of it. So is this, um, I hope in some way this is uh, profiting you in the development yes. of your arguments for your case. Um, it goes without stating that, um, yeah, I've probably given you at least 100 ways to end your case in one question. We just have to see what methods you uh, elect. Um, really? Mm-hmm. Um, can we take a, a break here for a minute? My phone's going to die. I uh, got to take mm. it in for a minute. Yeah, why not? <laughs> okay. Call me back. Okay.